Now we come to this week's interview, and as promised, it's with Mick Hopkins, lead guitarist and founder member of the group Quartz. Well, thanks, Daz, for inviting me. We've known each other for a few years now. You're a good, uh, a good man. Thank you. So, uh, thanks again. Right then, Mick. Can you tell me how you, well, how you basically started in the in in the music kit? <laughs> oh, well, how I started. It was uh, in the early sixties with a group called Jerry Levine and the Avengers. Mm. And we had a few notable people. Well, they, they became notable after, after it all split up. There was Graham Edge on drums, who left to join the Moody Blues. Right, yeah. And Roy Wood on rhythm guitar. Yeah. And then I went on to other bands after the Diplomats, when Denny Lane left to join the Moody Blues. Nicky James movement with John Bonham on drums. The Way of Life, which had got Bonham on drums again. The Lemon Tree, which in turn changed to uh, Copperfield. Uh-huh. And uh, of course, then I went with the Idol Race, yeah. when Jeff Lynne left to go with the move. And then uh, I went over to Canada and played over there. Yeah. Two other members in The Way of Life, born here, but went to live in Canada. Right. And uh, they got together, got a group over there, and the group invited me over when I went over and they were in, in the top ten. Hmm. And uh, the, the group was flood. They eventually turned into a group called Saga. Right, yeah. And came back here, uh, got together with uh, some lads at the Rum Runner Club in Birmingham. Hmm. And that was with Derek and Malcolm. Derek Arnold and Malcolm Cope, yeah. Uh, yeah. Malcolm Cope, yeah. I've known Jeff Nichols for... A number of years I've been playing with him in group, a group called Time. But uh, then we we eventually got together and as Bandy Legs. Right, yeah, yeah. We had a couple of singles which came to came to nothing really. And then uh, we uh, were invited to do a Sabbath tour and uh, Albert Chapman was managing, like, like a road manager called personal manager. Right. And, and uh, it, it came to Bloomers in Coventry Road, Birmingham. Mm-hmm. and uh, brought Tony along and uh, we went and toured with him which was quite uh, quite interesting <laughs> yeah I bet yeah was that still as uh, Bandy Legs at that point Bandy Legs yeah we'd be signed to Jet Records yeah and this chap called Ronnie Fowler uh, came up with the idea for Quartz he says Quartz is a it's a rock it beats mm-hmm. and all this so we used that so what, <clears throat> what year was that then that you became Quartz of course, it was 70, like 76. So obviously then you was, were you then sort of getting material together for what became the first album? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we used to rehearse in uh, Derek's garage and uh, Tony came and had to listen to the stuff and he threw stuff out that he thought was a bit, you know, not good enough. Yeah. And then we'd, we'd sort of hone everything, get it to the way everybody was happy with. We went to... Um, to record at Morgan Studios in London. Right, yeah. Which uh, was quite interesting. And of course, I've been known Tony for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, we, we did all right. I mean, uh, the thing I liked about it was uh, Tony and I played the harmony parts for Mainline Riders. Well, Tony actually played on that, did he? Yeah, he, he played the harmony. We both played harmonies on it. Right, okay. Because something else, somebody mentioned something about Don Airy playing, Don, Don Airy had said that he played the courts, hmm. and somebody disputed the fact. Well, Don is on the other. Right, is he? Right, okay. He's playing the keyboards on Devil's Brew. Yeah. The first... there's, been, there's been some things uh, going around about uh, Ozzy singing and, uh, and Brian May. Well, Ozzy was singing, like backing vocals, but he kept saying, uh, Charlie kept saying, I was like, can you get, move away from the mic a bit? Can you move away, <laughs> a bit more, a bit more? So he eventually was too bloody far. You know? <laughs> and uh, Brian May said, um, we played him a track. He says, I think I can, uh, I can I can, do this for you, you know. Uh, I'll do it for Queen. You know? He said, all right. He says, go and have a drink. Go around the pub and have a drink. So we went out to the pub, came back, and he was he got bloody tight around his neck and he was on the floor and all this. He says, yeah, this is what I've done. So puts it on. And he says, I think it was okay as it was. 
That was it. That was, that's what it was. Ozzy did sing, but was did to pray on the album because Tony didn't like the idea. No, but uh, Brian tried to, to edit a song and it didn't work out the way he wanted it. Was that on the track Circles, uh, Mick, was it? Circle, Circles, yeah. And that actually didn't appear on the album in the end, did it? No, no. no. <laughs> it was a, a B-side original. Right, OK. So that was 1977? 77, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I was working at Reddington's Rare Records for a time. Yeah. Danny Reddington came up with the idea of having a live album. And he paid for it. Right. We did all that. And we had Satan Serenade out on Reddington's. Uh, Logo Records became involved. Logo were a subsidiary company of uh, RCA. And they released Satan Serenade as, as well as uh, Danny releases on Reddington's Rare Records. And um, then, of course, there was the MCA album after that, after all that. Which was Stand Up and Fight. Stand Up and Fight, yeah. When did you start working on that album then? We were writing stuff. Derek and I were writing Stand Up and Fight in a hotel room. Okay. And uh, what, while you was out on the road? Yes. Uh, I'd already got ideas for Charlie Snow. Yeah. And uh, that's the way we're doing it. It's just sort of going and recording something. Once we got it right, coming out and going back to the hotel... Having something to it, whether we were working on the next few songs that we were going to record, it was quite a. I mean, there were some that we put in which we'd already recorded some time ago. We were ready to. There was Wildfire mm. and Can't Say No to You, but the rest that were record were all put together in a, in a hotel room. So that ultimately then became the, the Stand Up and Fight album? Yes, yeah. Um, just, just before we, we we go on to that, you've pl- you played. Uh, the Reading Festival three times. Uh, yeah. What What are your recollections of playing the festival? Oh, it's fabulous. Well, I bet it Brilliant. was. Brilliant. I bet it was. You know, I mean, uh, you get, uh, I mean, when it's time to go on, you get brown trouser time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've you, you, you just got uh, all the amplifiers and you can't see much at first. You just come in up onto the stage and walk around the amplifiers. All of a sudden, you see this great big vista of, Massive people, yeah, and it's it, making brilliant, brilliant, yeah. brilliant, and the whole thing, you know, marvelous. I loved it, I did. Well, I bet you did. Oh, well, actually, I am going to just say this then. Um, the, the, there is an, an audience recording then that's uh, appeared after all these years, and the one thing that that struck me listening to it um, was was the way Taffy uh, Taffy Taylor played the crowd. Um, oh, he always did. That was his forte. Uh, he loved the crowd. Uh, yeah. it, it's it's just joyous to hear how he um, <laughs> how he gets them going, basically. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I mean, I, I was never lucky enough to meet the man, but it, it, it sounded it sounds like he was a great front man. Put it oh yeah, yeah, fabulous. You know. <laughs> so okay, so uh, yeah, so you played the Reading Festivals. Uh, the last one being nineteen eighty, which. Which was the year that Stand Up and Fight came out. Yep. You, re- you recorded that with a very famous producer, then, Derek Derek Lawrence. Uh, yeah. What What was it yeah. like working with him then, Mick? Well, you, you could tell he, uh, he knew what he was on about. Uh, yeah. There were certain things that I didn't like, but it was because we were pushed for time in places. Yeah. But uh, he, uh, when you think of uh, the, the history of the guy, I mean, like uh, Wish Bone Ash. Yeah. Deep Purple. Yeah, what a pity. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, knew, he knew his stuff, and mm. he used to come up with ideas as well. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting, quite interesting, you know, the whole thing. So we're going to have a listen to a, a, a piece of music now. This is um, something that you've um, chose for us. Uh, could you just tell us what it is then, Mick, please? Yeah, Stand Up and Fight. One of my favourite uh, songs, yeah. and uh, it's on the Stand Up and Fight album.
looking at it now from the period of say 79 80 time being what's called a new wave of british heavy, heavy metal band but yeah i mean we, we were around before that of course but of course. Uh, we were we were fighting the punk thing yeah uh, we carried on doing what we could mm-hmm. uh, and sort of you know, like, uh, I couldn't believe it when people were being spat at you all the time. I thought, what a big game this is. And uh, we just carried on as best we could. Somebody says, oh, you kept the flag flying. Yeah. Uh, sort of thing. So and they're, they're saying that, oh, you you, you were before, you, you know, the British ever met. We were on the cusp, you know. I mean, we were sort of uh, in between, if you like. To me, people tend to put, they've got to put people in a bag. Right? Yeah. You, you do this. You, you, you don't do this. You don't. And like to me, it's it's music. Yeah. Just music. Uh, whatever. It's just stuff that you can tap your foot to, bang your head to. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you're dead right. Uh, I it, stand up and fight is held as a new wave of British heavy metal classic. Uh, mm. Now, like you say. People do get um, put into a, a uh, into a pigeonhole, if you like. But um, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, you are what I consider to be a forerunner of of the movement. But um, mm. but yeah, you know when obviously the Stand Up and Fight album uh, came came about then. Yes, MCA. I'm I'm I'm, I'm look I'm looking at MCA. You know. It seemed to me that they knew there was something going on, you know, in as much that when I look at there was bands on the neat record label up, uh, up yes. in the northeast, they all of a sudden started signing all of them. So yeah. Say all of them. White Spirit was one that springs to mind. Obviously, yeah. you played yeah. with on on tours. Um, Tigers of Pantang, yeah. y- yourselves. They obviously yeah. knew there was something going on here. We've got to get the, got to get on board with this. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. And caught wind of, of all this, and uh, thought well, we better start signing everybody up then. Yeah. The only problem is with that is the fact that when you go and sign everybody, you don't concentrate on one or two. Yeah. You got like loads of people. So some of these managers, yeah. uh, they sign up for loads of people, but they there's only certain ones that get get on because that they they concentrate on uh, just one or two acts out of the whatever they've got. So I mean, they've got you know. Around this time, uh, give or take the odd year or two, I mean, you you, you were playing some some great shows. Uh, that uh, I mean, you you we, you know, you're playing with, with bands like Rush. Um, oh, Rush! That's yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, um, uh, they had just finished the sound check, mm. and uh, I was walking onto the stage, and Geddy Lee was walking towards me, mm. and he goes, "I know you. <laughs> you play." In Toronto, oh, at the right. Abbey Road Tavern or Pub or I, I said to him, I said, my God, I said, you've done more to us than I've had hot dinners and you recognise me. He says, yeah, of course, yeah. So from then on, um, uh, when we go out there to wait, we used to go have it with them. Normally, the headliners were, were kept away from any support acts or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they wanted us to go and sit with them and have a laugh and one of the I mean, as you were saying, like uh, Taffy and was the way he was. He used to get on with anybody. Yeah. And of course the Canadians loved him. Uh, oh, you know, the, the Rush guys. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean you obviously spoke about you played with Sabbath. I mean Black Sabbath, I mean yeah. yeah. Uh yeah. But, uh, I mean I, I I look I look back at uh you've you Gillen. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, UFO? Did you play with UFO, mate? Yeah, UFO. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a Europe. Is that a European tour? Was it? Right. Okay. Europe. Yeah. yeah. And and um, obviously, ICDC. ICDC was in Europe. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and uh, UFO as well. And you obviously, you know, the the the, the albums come out, stand up and fight, and you obviously were promoting that uh, on on tours of your, tours of your own. You know, I mean. Uh, were they, were they quite heavy schedules back in them days, were they? Well, we, I'm looking back now, I mean, some of the stuff we played, we did tour after tour and doing our own gigs as well. And you think to yourself, how the hell did we do all that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But like, it's, yeah, it, you know, it's the thrill, this excitement, the adrenaline, it's flowing. But yeah. um, we had some great times. 
So, between 1980 and 1983, what what because what I'm what I'm working towards is the uh, Against All Odds album. What 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 yeah. was going on then between 1883 then? That's when uh, we got uh, Jeff Baiting, yeah, the group, and uh, we got the stuff together from uh, Against All Odds there, and uh, that was interesting as well because it was a different in, in a way it was. Uh, uh, we were going in a different direction. Yeah. Really, because I've been listening to uh, groups like Journey, etc. But people tended to seem to like it, but it wasn't uh, wasn't the same as the the old stuff. And, uh, but Dot Jeff Bate did a grand job of singing, and uh, he's back with us now. Yeah, well, a good job now. I mean, yeah. when you think there's been a big big change, I mean, the number of years it's been since we got together. And, because there was some stuff that they used to see that was really not more like Daddy Holder, you know, like powerful. It got a slightly different feel about about it compared to Stand Up and Fight. Um, yeah. So that that was something that you was kind of you know purposely in the in the writing. Well, well, it wasn't purposely; it was oh. sort of subconsciously because you hear something. Yeah. Uh, and it gets into subconscious, yeah. and then uh, you start writing stuff, and it comes out, but you don't realise. Mm. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard. You, you can't turn around and say, "I'm going to write a paranoid." No, right? no, no. Or so well, I'm going to write a Sabbath, bloody Sabbath, or something. It, it doesn't work like that. You just mm. uh, you caught me something psychic. Like you, you pull it out of thin air, mm. and you, you you think, "Oh, that ain't too bad. I like that riff, or oh, use that, and blah blah blah." And then eventually, uh, everybody else gets involved, and that's how you uh, you get the uh, the song put together. You know. well, well, absolutely. I mean, mind you, uh, you look at a track like "Buried Alive." I mean, that really is a, a bone cruncher. You know, I mean, y- you know. So obviously, uh, you were still consciously writing stuff like that at the time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, that was nineteen eighty three. At what point did the band? Sort of stopped then. It was only about, it was about 83, 84. I didn't do that much for a time. No. Um, I did a production job with, with for Renaissance. But uh, uh, no, we, we, we didn't get back together again proper until 2011. Right, so that's what, what became the reunion then, and like you say, 2011. Yeah. So how did that come about then? Well, it was... Uh, it was a charity do. Really. They um, they got this together for this uh, Stuart Clark, who was a great great guitarist. And he died, yeah. and we did the show, and we went down great, and then we said, "Oh, because well, well, we got Dave involved there." Well, that's that's really when our paths first yeah. crossed, wasn't it? You know. Um... Yeah, I found, I found Dave up the one day. I said, "Look, I said, I don't know how you feel about this, I said, but we're going to do a charity gig. Uh, would you be prepared to?" Uh, to have a go at first he was a bit dubious and eventually he says all right then so and, uh, we got together for that and once we'd done done that gig you know, another one came up and then everybody was saying well we've got we've got a few songs talking about what about recording something guy says oh yeah i was in my studio and, was, and that's how it all uh, came about so this is this is dave garner who, who actually um were your first work with Dave on the Against All Odds sessions? Is, is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we did uh, Better Than Live. Yeah. Uh, uh, Silver Wheels, stuff like that, yeah. Like you say, you did the, you did the reunion show uh, with Cryer. Um, yeah. I, I, mean, I remember it well, it, and it was a fantastic uh, performance. Mm. Great, great evening. Mm. Both bands were tremendous mm. on the night. Mm. And then <laughs> you, uh, well, you went to Keep It True in 2013. Yeah. What yeah. Uh, What were your recollections of that uh, that performance and weekend? Tell you what, Daz, it was brilliant. It was, wasn't brilliant. it? It was. And, uh, well, yeah, you, you were there to Keep It True. I was, yes. When when they, um, when we started doing Saturn Serenade. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. I think I told you this, uh, Jeff, did the da 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 da, yeah. da, da and then I come up with da 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 da, da right? yeah, yeah. and to see a crowd of 
people from all over the place start singing along to it. And you see them mouthing some of the words, if they don't use them. And you think, my God, like years ago, I would, would never have thought that I'd been in that situation. And they, they, know the, they know the songs, you know, and they're younger than we are. It was like a football crowd, Mick. It was, yeah. it was just electric. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. like you say, they, they started chanting that and it just kept it was yeah. going on and on and on. And it was brilliant. Yeah. It was brilliant. A woman was on about uh, signing autographs. Yes. We all said, yeah, okay, I think it would be about <laughs> half a dozen people. Yeah. And this and the crowd appeared. Yeah. Long line of people. And they got CDs, they got albums, they got <laughs> photographs, they got all sorts. And there we are, signing all this stuff. And uh, I went, such nice people. And that's one thing about uh, heavy rock, heavy metal, whatever. Uh, they're such nice, decent people. No. And, uh, you know, people tend to think, oh, you know, long-haired louts, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's, it's, uh, to me, it's a cult now, I'm not sure it has been. And that's it, carrying it on, and that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah. You was only allowed 15 minutes for that signing session, and that yeah. overrun, hell, but a hell of a way. You know, mm. Uh, mm. so yeah, that, that really was a fantastic weekend. Obviously, mm -hmm. you played a, um, quite a few more uh, shows. Did Sweden? Yeah, yeah. Mus Muscle Rock. Muscle Rock. Yeah. Uh, uh, we did the London Live uh, Live Evil. Yeah. You know, come and I say this to every, all, all the bands I speak to. Come around about two thousand ten ish. You know, give or take a year, maybe before that. All of a sudden, a lot, hell of a lot of these bands reformed from that period, and uh, they reformed, and there was a surge, a massive surge of interest in 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 the uh, in the new wave of British heavy metal movement. Yeah, yeah, hold on, yeah, can't you believe know. it. I mean, the thing is, uh, is when you get to foreign countries. Mm. Mm -hmm. Uh, people are all speaking English. Yeah. Uh, you have people writing down lyrics in English. Mm -hmm. uh, they ask, come up and ask you what the lyrics are for certain songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we were in Denmark. <coughs> uh, what they'd done was they'd put up like a, it was a, a fence uh, with a drape on it. And you got R.I.P. Jeff Nichols, mm -hmm. Taffy Taylor. Uh, yeah. And you got to remember these these are people from Denmark that have done this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, we I mean, we knew nothing about it until we got there. And there was this. Uh, it's quite touching, that isn't it? Really, you know. R.I.P. to two two chaps out of the group. Yeah. Yeah. Two thousand sixteen. Then you bought out Fear No Evil. It, it ended up. I thought it was okay, actually. You know, it wasn't too bad. There were certain things I wasn't too pleased about, but that's the way things are. I think, um, it's, I think it's a great album, personally. But, you know... Like, it's having been involved with it, you know, you, you, you write something, you yeah. get an idea, but it just actually turned out the way you wanted it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's on the way to it, but, like, not fully, you know what I mean? As, as, we, all, as we know now, Jeff Nichols sadly passed away in 2017. That, that must have been a sad, sad time for you. Uh, well, I'd known, I'd known him for 50 years. Yeah. It was like, uh, we were like brothers, weren't we? Yeah. Although we, I didn't see him for 20 years uh, when he left to go over to the States. Mm. But I'd known him for 50 years. You know? Yeah. And uh, we, <laughs> we used to do some nice arrangements and guitar parts and whatever. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that I liked was when we, we worked out mainline riders. Yeah. And uh, then eventually... When we went into the studio, uh, Jeff was, you know, quite good about it. He says, like, uh, I don't mind if, if Tony plays. He did a solo on something. I can't remember who it was now. Um, I think it was Pleasure Seekers or just Street Fighter Landy, one of the two, anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yes, it was quite a, quite an interesting experience. I bet it was, yeah. I bet it was. So let's move on then to the, uh, the the album then that you've been working on. That, um... The idea was 
uh, Jeff said to me before he passed away, a few weeks before, he says, I'd like to think that uh, my, my sons that I haven't completed, uh, that you could complete them and put them on the album. Right, okay. Which uh, was quite uh, got to be. And we went and um, got all the backing recorded and uh, used his voice, his keyboards and guitar, bits of guitar. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it was a case of fingers crossed when we tried it in, on the recording to see whether everything worked out okay. And it, as luck would have it, it did. So, so um, that was uh, that was interesting for us. Uh, and we got some of his stuff down. So you kind of <clears throat> pieced your pieced your um, parts around what Jeff had already laid down, then, did you? Yeah, uh, yeah. I I took t- I got the all the vocals separate. Right. Okay. Like uh, just did all that we did all the backing and mm. then put the vocals in to what we'd done. Right, on with you. Yeah. And there's, uh, there's three, I think there's three or four songs that we did like that. Oh, excellent. And that, that'll be on, that, it'll be pointed out on the, on the, uh, on the album, on the actual sleeve. You know, just saying, like, this is Jeff. And, uh, cause I mean, it's, 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 it's across the board now. I mean, you got, you got, you got two Jeffs. You got Jeff Nichols. You got Jeff Bates. Yeah. You've got, uh, Tony Martin doing a track. Derek, which is a first for him, because he'd never sung Lee before. So uh, that's how we got through it. Um, I mean, I was hoping that Dave would finish the album off. Right. Uh, but it didn't turn out that way. No. So uh, you, you, that's one of those things. It, it, am I right that it's it's complete then? Complete up to, up to a point. I mean, it needs uh, mixing there. Uh, and we and we couldn't do it because uh, Miguel, the engineer, is Portuguese, mm. and he comes over here for about six months or something. And he goes back to Portugal, so he goes back, and now there's this uh, ban on people coming back from Portugal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so we can, and of course you got all this lockdown thing. With, we, we couldn't go and record in the studio anyway. No. So that's holding everything up. So, um, so just to give us a just to give us a little idea, then what uh, what are we are we looking to expect here? Then are, are we still looking at the uh, the quartz trademark sort of uh, well heavy guitars sort of thing? And uh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, oh yeah. There's a few different ideas. Like we did this one song called "World of Illusion," yeah, which Jeff had. Uh, done a demo of, but he hadn't completed it. Mm. Right. And it was a bit like a, like a Sabbath song. Uh, mm. Sort of, uh, not, not, a, not, you know, one of the slow ones that Sabbath used to do. Yeah. And uh, I, I should be interested to, interested to hear what you think. Oh, well, so we'll look forward to that coming out then. Well, Mick, I'd like to thank you for joining us uh, on uh, this week's DJ's Denim and Leather and uh, wish you all the best with the new album. And, uh, thank you. And all the best for the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to you. It's been a pleasure. And I think you're doing a grand job. Thank you, sir. And we need, uh, we need more of this going on. It's, it's, it's a good movement, you know, the heavy rock, heavy metal movement. Yeah. That's what we need. Yeah. And you're doing it. Thank you. Cheers.